Hello and welcome to this episode of Ask CPS. My name is Dr. Lee Bowman and I'm an epidemiologist working at CPS. Uh, today we have two of my colleagues with us, uh, Dr. Daphne Illis and Dr. Willemaine Van Loen. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bowman. Thanks for taking the time to be with us today. So today's topic is uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. So a very pertinent topic. Everybody's talking about it. So maybe we can jump right in. Uh, Dr. Illis, can you tell us a little something about the COVID-19 vaccine? Of course. But actually, there's no such thing as the COVID vaccine. There are many COVID vaccines in different countries. A couple of them have been approved by national and international regulatory agencies, which means they're deemed safe to use for vaccinating large groups of persons. And those are the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. But maybe I should tell you something about vaccines in general. Sure, yeah, go ahead. The first vaccine technique was invented more than 200 years ago when Dr. Jenner discovered the pus from cowpox and humans in a low dose, it made them immune for smallpox. He called his method vaccination and the substance was called vaccine. It was an important breakthrough because up to 10% of the population died from smallpox at the time. And with the help of this vaccine, smallpox got eradicated completely. In later times, the vaccine methods were refined, but the principle is still the same. You apply a substance to the body that contains a harmless version of a virus or parts of it. Your body then starts to make antibodies against those particles, but you don't get sick because the virus is made into a harmless version. Making antibodies against a virus is called an immune reaction and having the antibodies in your body is called immunity. When you get the actual virus in the future, the antibodies in your body will recognize it and can fight the virus quickly before the virus has a chance to spread in your body and make you sick. So if you were to get the virus through natural infection, your body would also make antibodies, is that correct? Yes. When you get infected with a virus without being vaccinated, your body will also make antibodies. But it takes time to make antibodies. And during this time, you will get sick. And if you get sick, you can die as well. So a vaccine only stimulates an infection without making you sick. So we've had vaccines for quite a long time. You described the history from Dr. Jenna, Jenna onwards. Um, do you think that vaccines still have an important role to play in the modern world? Yes, definitely. Vaccines are an important part of healthcare and they save millions of lives every year. They are the more successful medical intervention due to vaccinations, the spread of dangerous diseases like polio, tetanus and measles have reduced dramatically. Many of you will remember taking your children to the baby clinic to get their vaccinations. And some of you will remember the nurses coming to school to give you your vaccination at an older age. Great, so, so in, the, in, in the contemporary environment, uh, why do you think- Go it's ahead, so Mr. Bo Dr. Bowman. So, yeah. Uh, so why do you think it's so important that we need a COVID vaccine right now? We have been dealing with COVID for about a year now. And unfortunately, unfortunately, it still rules our daily lives. Many might know someone who died from COVID or got severely ill. Some might still be struggling with long term effects after getting sick. Some have lost their job or have their companies crumbled. Others have not been able to see their family and loved ones for months because traveling is hard. So there are so many ways 
that this COVID-19 pandemic has affected our daily lives, whether socially, educationally, or economically. Even after a year of living a restricted life, we have not been able to get the virus fully under control. But we finally have against COVID, and this can help us fight the virus better than before. In order to really make a difference, the majority of St. Martin has to get vaccinated. Vaccination is not only of importance to protect yourself, but also to protect the community. The more people are vaccinated, the bigger the impact for St. Martin. So we'll talk a little bit more about herd immunity later on, um, but just to ask you the million dollar question, would you yourself uh, get the vaccine? Absolutely. I will be first in line for the vaccine. Great, glad to hear it. Okay, so we'll just bring in Dr. Willemaine van Leeuwen uh, now to ask a few more questions about the COVID vaccine uh, in particular. Um, so again, welcome and, and thanks for joining. The COVID vaccines were developed over a relatively short time frame. That's relative to the normal time that it takes for a vaccine to be produced. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that process and, and how it might or might not have affected vaccine production? Uh, sure, of course, Dr. Bellman. Well, uh, first of all, of course, it's always good to uh, wonder about safety. And indeed, the COVID vaccines were de developed within a year, while it usually takes a few years to develop a new vaccine. Um, but let me explain how this could be done in a safe way. First of all, the COVID virus is similar to the SARS virus that caused an epidemic in 2003. So some knowledge was already available, and that knowledge was used for the COVID vaccine. Second, because so many countries are affected, many organizations work on the development at the same time and they share their knowledge and help each other. And also, because COVID is such a big problem, organizations are very motivated to solve it. So a lot of time, money and manpower are dedicated to research and approval processes. For other vaccines, medical researchers often have to wait for funding or until enough volunteers are recruited in order to perform a new stage of research. And usually, the stages of research are done one after another, and that takes time. For the COVID vaccine, some stages were done at the same time. However, none of the stages were skipped. If a stage is skipped or the quality of one stage is not good enough, the vaccine cannot get approval and will not be used to vaccinate large groups of people. Importantly, if there are any safety concerns discovered during any stage, the trial will end and the vaccine will not be approved for use. Okay, so if I understand correctly, we've got usually the phases that begin phase one, then it's phase two, then it's phase three. But what you're saying essentially is the vaccine phases were overlapping. Uh, so they ran at uh, the same time, which is how we were able to shorten that time frame. That's, that's, a, that's a, a major development for vaccine production, I suspect. So that's Indeed. clear. A little bit more now about uh, how the COVID vaccine works. Of course. Uh, well, like Dr. Illis said, there are many types of vaccines. And the first COVID vaccines that got improved uh, were Pfizer and Moderna, which means these vaccines are, are safe to use for vaccination of large groups of people. Pfizer and Moderna are both mRNA vaccines. Let me explain how mRNA vaccines work. Um, the vaccine contains mRNA particles, and mRNA is like a recipe to make proteins. This recipe is used by your cells to produce a specific part of the COVID virus, the spike protein. After that, your body will start making antibodies. The mRNA will be broken down by your body in a few days, but the antibodies remain. If you later get the actual COVID-19 virus, your antibodies will recognize the spike protein on the real virus. These bodies, these antibodies will fight the COVID virus before it can spread in your body and make you sick. Okay, so now this brings us on to um, additional questions. So we recently ran a survey um, within St. Martin um, to gain the uh, knowledge, attitudes and practices of uh, the respondents and so people of St. Martin um, to the vaccine as well as to COVID-19 and what they thought about it generally. 
Um, we had some responses, quite a large majority of people were worried that the vaccine was going to change their DNA. Um, so could you allay our concerns? Well, it's, uh, I mean, a good question, um, but the answer is no. An mRNA vaccine does not change your genes or change anything in your body's DNA in any way because the mRNA cannot reach the part of your cells that store your DNA. You have to look at it this way. This is your body cell. The center of the cell is called the nucleus. Inside the nucleus, your DNA is stored. mRNA will enter your cell, but it cannot enter. So it cannot affect your DNA in any way. Also, um, the mRNA in the vaccine is only a recipe for the spike protein. It has no ability to do anything else than instruct your cells to produce the spike protein. After that, they're breaking down by your body in a natural way. And actually, when you get the real COVID-19 virus, the virus uses mRNA to instruct your cells to produce and replicate the whole virus so it can spread. The vaccine just mimics a part of the infection in a harmless way so you don't get sick. Okay, um, some interesting points there that we can come back to in our next discussion. Um, uh, let's uh, just jump straight in, though, and ask, uh, would you personally take the vaccine? I would definitely take the vaccine because I want to contribute my part to the community. Vaccination will not get us out of the COVID crisis immediately, but it's an important and essential step to get there. The more people are vaccinated, the bigger the impact, like Dr. Illis just said. I would also advise everyone to make sure you are informed about the effects of the vaccine. If you have any questions about the vaccine, speak to your healthcare provider or visit trustworthy information sources, such as the World Health Organization website or the sources of CPS and the government of St. Martin, like the Facebook pages. Perfect. Um, so that uh, brings to a close uh, this segment of our CPS. Uh, stay tuned and we will be back shortly. Thanks very much. so far. Here are some basic information about vaccines. When you encounter a virus, if your body recognizes the virus, it will trigger a natural defense reaction. Your body will then start to produce antibodies designed to fight off that virus in the future. Your body remembers. However, if the next encounter with a virus is a new one, your body doesn't have any antibodies yet, and you can get sick. Vaccines A vaccine is a harmless, inactive part of a virus, or a copy. This way, your body can start producing antibodies without getting sick. So the next time you encounter the same virus, your body remembers it and will defend itself. And welcome back to this episode of Ask CPS, where we are talking about the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, so welcome back again to Dr. Van Leeuwen and Dr. Illis. Um, I'm going to jump right in and ask a couple of questions, Dr. Van Leeuwen. Would you be able to tell us a little bit more about the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine? Because I understand that the mechanism is slightly different to the vaccines that we talked about previously, the mRNA vaccines that are produced by Moderna and Pfizer. Uh, of course I can, Dr. Bowman. Indeed, uh, so the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is the third vaccine that got approved. And indeed, it works different than the mRNA vaccines that I explained earlier. So Oxford AstraZeneca is, uh, they created a vaccine that is a vector vaccine. Um, it means that 
they took a harmless virus, in this case an adenovirus that is more uh, more commonly known as the common cold, um, and they emptied it and, and added the RNA of the COVID-19 virus. Um, this was all done in a, in a way that made it a harmless version. And then it enters your body, it enters your cells, um, and uh, your body will start making antibodies against the COVID-19 virus without actually making you sick. Okay, uh, great. And just to clarify, it's not if I were to receive this vaccine, I wouldn't then get the common cold. Uh, you would also not get the common cold, no. So you would not get the symptoms of the common cold and you would not get the symptoms of the COVID-19 virus. Perfect. Um, Dr. Illis, uh, moving uh, in the direction from individual vaccines to now herd immunity, we touched on this principle earlier on. Could you give us a bit more information about how herd immunity works and why it is so important that uh, as many people as possible take this vaccine? With herd immunity, with herd immunity, so we are looking at how many persons in the, com the population is vaccinated. So that the more persons are vaccinated, they protect the smaller group that is not vaccinated. And for herd immunity to be effective, it has to be 80% of your population vaccinated for COVID-19 so that they can protect the remaining 20% if they are not able to get, be vaccinated. Okay, great. So, yeah, just to paraphrase. We Go prefer on. for them to take the vaccine for the herd immunity than for persons to get sick to, and get the antibodies to the, the virus to for us to have the herd immunity in that way. So essentially, this uh, this is a mechanism to allow those people who cannot take the vaccine, for instance, they might have uh, severe allergies, uh, to be protected by the rest of the herd who is able to take the vaccine. Correct. Yes. Okay. This brings us on to uh, some of the metrics that surround uh, how the vaccine works. So, Dr. Van Loen, um, in a nutshell. Do the vaccines reduce transmission or do they just uh, reduce the severity of symptoms? Uh, well, at this point in time, uh, we know that the vaccines uh, prevent against getting severely ill from COVID-19, from the COVID-19 virus. Um, at this point in time, we do not know yet to what extent they will also prevent uh, the virus from, from uh, being spread to others. So the numbers that you hear about 90% or 95% efficiency, um, they refer to the protection that you get from getting severely ill from COVID. We think or we hope that it will also protect you uh, from spreading the virus to others so that it will be less common in the community, but time will have to prove this. Mm. So the scientific thought behind that is that those people who have uh, uh, mild symptoms or no symptoms at all tend not to transmit uh, as effectively as someone who is severely unwell. Sorry, can you repeat that question? Yeah, so just to paraphrase, um, in essence, the, if the vaccine is reducing the morbidity or the symptoms that you get with COVID-19, um, and the more symptomatic you are, the more likely you are to transmit, Therefore, mm -hmm. the vaccine is hopeful in reducing transmission as well. So that is true. People who are more severely ill, so for example, persons who are coughing and sneezing uh, with a higher, higher viral load, they are more uh, likely to spread the virus to others. While persons who don't have any symptoms, so for example, not coughing and sneezing, can also infect other persons, but the chance that they infect others is lower. Um, so if the... What we think is that if the virus prevents you from getting those symptoms, it will also be efficient in not spreading it to others. Um, and also because after you are vaccinated, your body is prepared to fight the virus itself because it always already has the antibodies. So the virus will not have the chance to replicate itself much in your body because the antibodies are already attacking it. That means that there is a much shorter time where you can where you can get sick, and also so a much shorter time where you are able to infect others. So essentially, once you've taken the vaccine, you could still possibly be infected, 
But the likelihood is that if you were infected, your antibody response would be almost immediate and you wouldn't get any symptoms and you wouldn't be able to transmit or very unlikely to transmit to someone else. Correct, indeed. Okay, Dr. Dr. Illis, um, let's talk a little bit more about the vaccine and some of the side effects that I might experience if I were to take it. Well, some of the side effects are the same as taking the other vaccines that, the, that we give uh, on the market now, and that fatigue, you may get a slight fever, soreness at the site where you got the vaccination, some redness, and those are the major side effects that you may see. They have been, we've, and you know, there's um, in social media, there is some information going around about Bell's palsy, but however, there have been a few cases, but there's no causality between Bell's palsy and getting the vaccination. You may also get anaphylactic reaction, and uh, that's why it's recommended that the vaccine is given at a site where you have a physician so that that can be treated one time with the EpiPen. And uh, that's also a rare side effect. So it's not seen that, um, that much, as well as persons that have had an allergic reaction to uh, ingredient in the vaccine those are the ones that we recommend not to take the vaccine, but not if you've had an allergic reaction to food or um, any other, uh, you know, medication that is not in the vaccine. Okay, so in terms of the groups that we can expect to vaccinate, uh, we're looking at uh, the, the data supports vaccination in those 18 years of, and, and older. Um, we don't recommend vaccination for pregnant women because there's not enough data uh, as yet. And those people who have severe reactions to medicines, in, in terms of like anaphylaxis, we would also not recommend uh, those persons to get the vaccine. Um, but I have to stress that those, uh, as Dr. Ellis mentioned, those uh, those um, consequences are extremely rare and anaphylaxis can be immediately reversed uh, with an EpiPen. So we've talked about um, some of the side effects that we can expect to see, which basically are mild and like any other uh, vaccine. Um, so what about uh, vaccine rollout? Uh, Dr. Ellis, you might be able to elaborate a little bit more on some of the risk groups uh, that uh, we might see vaccinated first. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, the risk group that will be vaccinated first are the elderly, so 60 years and over, as well as the healthcare workers that are at high risk of exposure, that are treating the frontline workers that are treating the COVID patients as well. They would be the first in line for the vaccine. And after that group, then um, there would be other groups. For instance, those persons that are high, uh, that have comorbidity, so you have your, your elder, you have your persons with diabetic, uh, hypertensive, those that live in, in group homes, for instance, um, the mental health foundation, those per that are under 60, that will be your next group. Okay. Um, I think as we're coming towards the uh, the end of the program, we can talk a little bit about the future. We can bring back uh, Dr. Van Leeuwen and, and, and talk about elimination versus eradication. So these are two technically uh, technical scientific terms. Elimination means that you uh, remove the virus from a certain geographic region. So for instance, if the virus is removed from uh, St. Martin, that it would be eliminated. And if we were to eradicate the virus, that would mean that it no longer exists on the planet, uh, as in smallpox and uh, rinderpest. Um, so, uh, Dr. Van Leeuwen, what are the chances that we are likely to see elimination here in St. Martin and indeed eradication globally? 
Um, so I think eradication uh, is not feasible in this stage because it's uh, COVID, the COVID virus has spread so widely and it's already uh, also mutating. So we have some variants, variants among us. I can also not say with certainty that we will be able to eliminate the virus entirely from St. Martin. However, if we have uh, uh, herd immunity, we definitely can can get the virus under control and make sure that once it is reintroduced in the community that we are able to act fast. Also because now we have uh, more things to treat them, um, like um, better medication, but also the vaccines in general. Now there are some variants uh, going around. You heard about the South African variant, the Brazilian one and um, uh, the UK variant. Uh, the good news with the vaccines, and especially with the mRNA vaccines that we have, is that there is a possibility to um, to adapt the vaccines to the new variants of the virus. So there is definitely potential to also um, to also fight the new variants. I think one thing I would like to add about what you said earlier um, about not getting the vaccine when you had a medication allergy. It is actually only a contraindication to get the virus, uh, to get the, the vaccine if you had, um, uh, if you had, have a severe allergic reaction to a specific ingredient of the vaccine. So for example, if you have, are allergic for amoxicillin or certain kinds of antibiotics, it doesn't necessarily mean you cannot take the vaccine. So in that case, it's good to go to your healthcare provider and talk about whether it would be safe for you to get the vaccine. Perfect. Um, that's really good information. Um, so that brings us to the end of this uh, episode of Ask CPS. Uh, thank you all for joining. Thank you, Dr. Van Leeuwen and Dr. Illis for joining. Thank you, thank you for too. having me. Most welcome. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this episode and we'll be back again soon. Thanks very much. Hello. So, what have you heard so far? Here's some basic information about vaccines. When you encounter a virus, if your body recognizes the virus, it will trigger a natural defense reaction. Your body will then start to produce antibodies designed to fight off that virus in the future. Your body remembers. However, if the next encounter with a virus is a new one, your body doesn't have any antibodies yet, and you can get sick. Vaccines A vaccine is a harmless, inactive part of a virus, or a copy. This way, your body can start producing antibodies without getting sick. So the next time you encounter the same virus, your body remembers it and will defend itself.